Good evening, everyone. Can you all hear me back there, back row? Welcome to the New England Aquarium Fall Lecture Series. Um, first of all, we want to express our gratitude to the Lowell Institute. Uh, they fund this lecture series, and so we're able to provide uh, these talks to all of you for free, which is a fantastic thing. Um, so you're in for a real treat tonight. We have uh, Dr. Michael Romero presenting highlights from over 25 years of research on stress responses in wildlife, both to natural factors in the environment and in relation to coping with human-related changes in their habitats. Dr. Romero is a professor in the biology department at Tufts University. He did his undergraduate work at Swarthmore College, his graduate work at Stanford University, and his postdoctoral work at the University of Washington. Um, so he's published numerous papers, well over 150, received many grants from NSF and other agencies, and he's had field projects all over the world, including Alaska, Greenland, Montana, Texas, California, Kenya, Chile, the Galapagos Islands, and suburban Massachusetts. His work has been featured widely in the press, including the New York Times Science section and a book on the natural history of the Galapagos. And he recently collaborated with John Wingfield to co-author the only book that currently explores stress in natural contexts, and it has a fantastic title, which is Tempests, Pox, Predators, and People stress in wild animals and how they cope. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Romero. Everybody hear me now? Excellent. Well, thank you so much for that introduction. That was wonderful. And uh, thank you so much for coming out tonight, especially as I'm seeing all the rain out there. It would have been much easier to stay home, I'm sure. And so hopefully I'll be able to give you a little taste of something that will take you home tonight and make you think about stress and wild animals and, and what we're doing here. So before I ever start a lecture on stress, I have to talk about what is stress. It means a lot of different things to many people, and it really turns out to be a difficult word to define. And the best definition I've ever found about stress is this. <laughs> Does this sound familiar to everybody? <laughs> yeah. So it's a wonderful definition. I love it. But it's filled with some really strange words like feeling and desire and deserving. Um, these are really difficult words to define themselves, and it's really hard to measure them. Now, I'm going to show you some work that I did up in the far north in Alaska with the Inupiaq natives. And I'm told that their word for scientist, when translated literally, means one who measures things. Now, I don't actually know if such a word exists. It's not on their online Inupia dictionary. But the essence of the word is correct. If we cannot measure something, then we can't study it scientifically. And so I can't use, actually, this definition in talking to you tonight about stress. Instead, what I'm going to be doing is just using stress as a shorthand for adapted neuro, neuroendocrine and endocrine responses to noxious stimuli. So what do I mean by that? Okay. This is my standard animal. Most animals you've probably seen look like this, right? They are all in a state of dynamic equilibrium. And what do I mean by dynamic equilibrium? Animals have to be in equilibrium, but that equilibrium can change. It changes over the course of day, changes over the course of night, changes depending on whether you're trying to be reproductive or not. So you're always shifting how you're going to be in the equilibrium, but the equilibrium has to be there. And so an animal must be in dynamic equilibrium in order to survive. And there are these things, noxious stimuli from the environment that we call stressors, and they serve to disrupt this dynamic equilibrium. Now, if this animal does not solve this problem, it's going to be dead. So it has a suite of adaptive responses, which we call stress responses, that serve to reestablish that dynamic equilibrium. Now, this is very different than what we talk about when we talk to each other about stress. It is very different than what biomedicine talks about in terms of stress and causing disease. What biomedicine is really talking about is this. When the adaptive responses themselves overshoot, and serve to disrupt the, the dynamic equilibrium itself. And this is what we would call stress-induced disease. But that's not really what I'm going to be talking about tonight. I'm going to be talking about how these two things are really balanced. 
so that the adaptive response sufficiently balances the dynamic equilibrium to allow wild animals to survive and thrive in their natural habitats. OK, so why study this in wild animals? Well, there's really two reasons. So we still don't know two fundamental things about stress. One is, how does a stress response help us to survive in the first place? We sort of have some ideas, but really we don't have a good idea of that. The second is, how or why does this overactive stress response end up causing disease? We've been studying stress in a biomedical context now for about 80 to 100 years, and we still don't have good answers to these two fundamental questions. And I think I know why. Because we share the same kinds of stress responses with all other vertebrate animals. And you think about what causes stress in a wild animal. And these are the kinds of things that would cause stress in us too. Things like predation attempts. However, how many of you have been chased by a predator at any time during your life? These are rarely occur in modern Western humans. How many of you have actually dealt with a famine? Again, very rare in modern Western humans. Inclement weather. There was a big hurricane recently down south, but everybody was either in houses, they weren't underneath the trees hoping to ride it out like a wild animal or our ancestors were doing. Infection. Most diseases in, modern West, in, in, in the West are now diseases of genetics, not diseases of infection. So again, these are kinds of things that we don't normally de have to deal with, and yet, these are rarely problems for modern Western humans, and yet these are the same kinds of stimuli that we ended up um, being evolved to cope with, and that's what our stress response is there for. Now, the fifth one here are social interactions, and this is what happens to us. Okay? Most of our stressors in, the modern, in modern life are social interactions. But what I want to do tonight is focus on, on these other aspects of it, these four things actually just the top three, and talk about how we might be able to understand more about how the stress response can help us and how it can hurt us by understanding how it does this in wild animals that are still having to cope with these kinds of stimuli. All right, so what am I talking about? So you have a stress, somehow we've got to get to survival. So here is a starling being chased by this bald eagle. This individual is now stressed. It is being chased by a predator. So what does it do? Well, the first thing it does is it has this discrimination determination function in the brain. It first has to decide that this stimulus is, in fact, a stressor. Now, that might not be <clears throat> uh, obvious to you, but let me explain and show you what I mean by an example. If you took me up into the top of an airplane and threw me out, I would have a stress response. But a lot of people do that for fun. It's called skydiving. It's the exact same stimulus being thrown out of an airplane, and yet one individual, me, is interpreting it as being a stressor. Other individuals are interpreting it as being fun. Okay? So there is some sort of determination or discrimination function. The brain has to decide that this stimulus is, in fact, a stressor. And once it does that, it then initiates two different responses. One is a fight or flight response, where you get the uh, release of adrenaline. And <clears throat> most of us are familiar with that. It happens within uh, milliseconds and try to get us away from things. And the other one is glucocorticoid release, the release of a, a series of hormones called glucocorticoids that then also help us in more of the longer term to cope with stressors. And so one of the things about studying stress in wild animals is that we need to know how they're coping with these, these different kinds of stressors. And these are some data that we collected a number of years ago. Whoops, sorry. This is the time after capture. So we are catching the wild animal and we're holding it. And these are the glucocorticoid levels. And what you see is that they increase over time. Now, I show this figure because these are the actual data that we have, but in order to um, sort of distill the essences of a lot of the data that I want to show you tonight, I'm actually going to simplify these figures. But I want you to know that all the data figures that I show you tonight actually have real data backing them up. So here's an idealized form of that same response. So we catch the animal at time zero, and we, hold, and we try to start taking blood samples. And look at the glucocorticoid levels in the blood. 
and we find that they start to increase at about three minutes after we catch and hold them. And then they start to rise. Now the interesting feature about this is that if we can get these blood samples in under three minutes, it's reflective of what the animal was seeing before we caught it. So we're able to understand how it was, what the levels were like prior to us catching it. And then we catch the animal and what we're doing is essentially acting as a uh, simulated predator. They think they've just been caught by a predator. They probably all think they're about to be eaten and we don't eat them. We let, let them go at the end of this, but what we watch is their glucocorticoid response over the next 30 minutes to the stress of being caught and handled. So all the data that I'm going to show you tonight is using this kind of paradigm of, of the researcher as the surrogate predator. Okay, so the well, first thing I want to talk about tonight is what are the responses during predation? And I want to talk about this in this animal. This is a brown lemon from up in northern Alaska. So here's Alaska, and here's Point Barrow, farthest northernmost point in, in Alaska. And that's the home of these brown lemmings. And if we look at the stress responses in brown lemmings, this is what we see. They're fairly low in June, and they get really high here in July. So there's a six weeks difference in the timing of this, and yet what we see is a huge difference in the amount of stress that these individuals are experiencing and their response to this simulated predator, us catching them. So what in the world is happening between June and July? Why are we seeing this big difference? This is what Barrow looks like in June. And what you can see is a lot of the ice and the snow. It's starting to melt out. But underneath that snow are all the lemmings and they're hiding from all the predators. And we know they're under there because <clears throat> When we look, they have these nests that they're building underneath the snow. And they're building these uh, tracks, and tunnels underneath the snow to go from different places and, and eat the, the grass. And we know that they're there because they're too small to hibernate. And the other problem in the Arctic is that the permafrost, or the frozen uh, tundra itself, is so hard that the animals can't burrow. So there's no way they can get under and hide. And so all they can do is use that snow to hide. Well, later, this is in July, six weeks later, all the snow is gone. There's no place for these lemmings to hide. And the only thing they could really do is they build these tunnels in the grass where they could run really fast and, tr and on the same track and try to escape from the predator. And by the way, this is how we catch the lemmings. So we walk around through the tundra until we see a lemming running in its, in its runway. And we put our foot on one side, and the lemming comes and hits our foot. And then it turns around to go the other way, and we put our foot there, and it comes and hits that foot. And before it gives up and starts running across, we reach down, grab it, and take our blood samples. Okay? So that's what I'm, so you see these data, that's what we're doing. Okay, now the problem of the Arctic is that lemmings aren't the only things that live up there. One of the things that lives up there is this. This is a snowy owl. And snowy owls breed up there, and they build their nests. And this is one of the nests we found. And here you can see the chicks sitting in the nest. Here's one of the eggs that's hatched. And right around it are all the dead lemmings that mom and dad killed to feed to their chicks. OK. So this was the most amazing nest you've ever seen. Because <clears throat> mom and dad snowy owl these birds are about one and a half to two kilograms in size, almost five pounds. These are big birds. And they laid 10 eggs in this nest, all 10 hatched. Three died after about three weeks during a storm, but they had seven chicks that they raised all the way to adulthood. So that's seven chicks plus two adults is nine birds, each about five pounds. And they are feeding them lemmings almost exclusively. And that's why you see all these dead lemmings. This was a, just a terrific mom and dad. So we come back to this figure. Why do we see this difference between June and July? Well, probably because of the predator pressure. That just existing with all of those predators flying around that are trying to eat you is highly stressful. Okay? So that's what we're talking about predation attempts. I can also show you some information about inclement weather, because they had very different responses. So this is, again, work that I'm going to show you from Barrow. And we did it on a number of different species. These are the common red poles. These are the Lapland longspurs, uh, snow buntings, 
These are the uh, white crowned sparrows. And they all winter down in the Great Plains and the southern U U.S. and northern Mexico and migrate up to Alaska to breed. And these are the Arctic terns, which actually winter down in Antarctica and come up to Alaska to breed. And I should tell you, uh, coming up to Alaska is a wonderful place for these birds to breed. And about 100 different bird species go up there to breed. And you think about why they would do that. Well, if you're a plant, being in the Arctic tundra is a wonderful place to be for about three months out of the year. Because what do you need if you're a plant? You need water, and the permafrost keeps all the water right there. So you have as much water as you want. Plus, there's 24 hours of sunlight. And so you have all the sun you want. And so the plants get to grow a lot. And guess what eats most, mostly eats plants? Insects. And so all the birds come up to eat the insects. Has anybody ever heard of the, snap, uh, the slap count? This is a way of estimating mosquito densities. So what you do is you bare your skin, usually your thigh, and you let all the mosquitoes land on it. And then you come down, and you slap, and you count the number you killed. I have been up in Alaska when the slap count has been over 200. So you know those head nets that people like to wear? Totally useless, because all the mosquitoes are right here, and you can't see anything. So DEET is my friend when I'm up there. Love DEET. OK, so all these birds are coming up here to breed. Now, the other thing we know about Alaska is there's a lot of weather and snow. This is one of my favorite pictures. This is a, what I call a find the nest shot. There is a nest in this bush that's just been covered with snow. I can't find that nest anymore. <laughs> I forgot where it was. But I know it's there because here's the bird sitting on her nest incubating her eggs in the middle of a snowstorm. Okay? Is this stressful? Well, maybe. You know, this is a picture of Barrow in the middle of, of June, a couple of days before the summer solstice. This, now, I want you to pay attention to this line of telephone poles right here, because these are the same telephone poles three days later on the first day of summer. This was highly stressful to me, okay? <laughs> Freaked me out. But was it stressful to these birds? And the answer apparently is no. So here are their glucocorticoid levels. And this is temperature at capture. So we were catching them anywhere from between 16 degrees Fahrenheit all the way down to 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Pretty rotten, crappy conditions. It was snowing, it was windy, it was blowing, and yet there is no difference in their glucocorticoid levels. They basically are not having a stress response at all. Remember that thing about discrimination, determination functions that are in the brain? These birds are taking a look at that snowstorm and they're saying, you know, eh, it's not a big deal. It's not a stressor. But after the breeding season, they are feeling stressed when the weather gets bad. Now, as the temperature decreases, their glucocorticoid levels go up, even though it never gets as bad as it did during the breeding season. So something has fundamentally shifted in the way in which these birds are thinking about these kinds of stressors. There wasn't a stressor when there was, they were breeding. It's a major stressor when they're not breeding. This was completely unknown in biomedicine in terms of how we think about different kinds of stressors. OK, so that's looking at predation attempts and looking at inclement, inclement weather. What I want to talk about now is looking at famine. And for famine, I want to turn to a completely different system. And that is down here in the Galapagos Islands off the coast of South America, looking at these creatures, the marine diving iguanas. So you're probably all sitting there thinking, what am I doing going to an aquarium lecture and always talking about birds and lemmings? Here is my marine organism. It's the only known um, marine going lizard. And so they feed off of all this wonderful algae. Now, most of them actually feed in the intertidal here. Even though they're called marine diving iguanas, actually only, depending on the island, only about 10 or 15 percent of marine iguanas are actually diving. Most of them just go into the intertidal and they eat all this wonderful algae. And here's a picture of them just munching this wonderful salad. And if you look underwater, you just see this big bloom of algae, wonderful things for these animals to eat. So this is during a normal year. However, as we all know, every few years there's an El Nino. And what happens during an El Nino, especially what happens here along the Galapagos Islands? Well, the Galapagos are right along the equator. And so the sun beats down on the equator. 
a lot of energy. And so you get a lot of evaporation of all the ocean water. And it forms huge clouds. And on top of that, we have the trade winds. And the trade winds push all those clouds over towards Indonesia. And they dump all their water in Indonesia. So what you end up with is jungles in Indonesia. And you have deserts on the coast of South America here. Now, because all that water has evaporated into the atmosphere and then gone all the way over to Indonesia, essentially a hole forms in the ocean. And so water, cold water and nutrients, upwell from the bottom of the ocean and fill in that area. And they bring all these wonderful nutrients into the Galapagos area. And it makes this area of one of the top fishing areas in the world. Now, that's normal years. So what happens during an El Nino? For reasons we still don't have a really a clue why it happens, the trade winds fail. And when the trade winds fail, all that water doesn't get moved over to Indonesia. So you end up with a drought in Indonesia. And in fact, all of that water starts falling here and you get all this kind of flooding in the coast of South America. And it continues to just drop and rain and evaporate and rain and evaporate and rain right on top of the Galapagos. And because of that, the hole in the ocean never forms. So you lose that upwelling of cold water and nutrients. And this is what it looks like during an El Nino in the Galapagos. Notice where all the food is for these iguanas. So you have iguanas desperately trying to scrape the scum, the last of the scum, off the rocks. And they sit here and they, they're, they're starving to death. So this individual doesn't even have enough energy left to keep its spines upright. They sore their fat in their tails right here. And you can see the bones are showing. And this individual is in great, great trouble. And if this continues for another couple of weeks, what you end up with is a lot of dead iguanas because they've starved to death. Now, this is a real tragedy for marine iguanas. It's a wonderful opportunity for a stress physiologist because now I can try to find out how did the stress response help them to survive or didn't. So we can capture these animals. You can just pick them up off the ground. They're very tame. And here's one of my assistants. We stuck this iguana head first into a bag so it doesn't hurt us and, they, it, and it doesn't hurt itself. And they have a, a vein running right down the, the bottom of the tail. And so here I am taking a blood sample from this iguana. And when we do that on a bunch of different animals that are doing well or starving, and look at their glucocorticoid levels, we find something really interesting. That this is a, 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 um, an index of body condition. And so when they're in really good condition, they're up here. And when they're in really bad condition, they're down here. And what we see is that their glucocorticoid levels stay really stable as they lose condition. They're starving, they're starving, they're starving until they get this point. And at that point, their glucocorticoid levels start to rise. And it increases dramatically. But not during most of this time here. It's only when they get to a certain point. And these kinds of data ended up having really important ramifications for biomedicine. Because it turned out that the US Air Force was really interested in starvation. Because they would often, during wars, they would often have their pilots shot down behind enemy lines. And they were trying to figure out, OK, how do we keep our pilots alive while they're sitting there with nothing to eat? And so they've been looking at these kinds of data from, from iguanas, from penguins, et cetera, looking how real animals deal with famine and how their stress response works. But one of the interesting things to me about this system was that an El Nino affects every single animal the same way. And yet, here's this individual animal still alive. It's not doing really well. He's still got lots of his fat here, but he's still alive. And this one is already dead. Why? Why is this one still alive and this one dead? Looking at the exact same conditions. And it turns out we think that there's two reasons for this. One is that this, <clears throat> the larger you are, the harder it is to get the energy you need to sustain yourself. So during an El Nino, most of the individuals that die are the biggest individuals in the population. The smaller you are, the more likely you are to last. And we think that one of the things the iguanas do is they, under, they don't understand this, but they start to shrink to get rid of some of their body. And so when we took x-rays of animals at the beginning and near the end of an El Nino, we found that their entire skeleton had shrunk. They actually get smaller during an El Nino in an attempt to try to survive. The other aspect of this 
is that they can turn off their stress response quicker. To the, remember, this is us catching them. So here we are at the beginning. Here's your glucocorticoid levels. This is the time after capture. This is the first couple of minutes. And then your glucocorticoid levels rise to, to being caught by us. And then they start to come back down through a process called negative feedback. And the idea is to shut down the response. And if you can, these iguanas, if they could shut it down quickly, they ended up mostly surviving. But if they couldn't shut it down quickly, and this was sustained for a longer period of time, they ended up mostly dying, being in, in a lot more trouble. And this is really interesting because post-traumatic stress disorder, a major problem for humans, also those individuals have a hard time shutting off their stress responses. And people have asked, why is that? And the answer might be that through evolution, the system is designed to try to be shutting off quickly. And that's what helps us to survive. And if we can't shut it off quickly, then we end up in disease. So this is an idea of how, again, we can use um, stress physiology to help us understand human illness. The other neat thing about the iguanas and the Galapagos, though, is that they're reptiles. And so they go into this really cold water, and they eat, and then they need to sun themselves. And so they get out on these rocks, and they get in the, in the sun, and they don't like to move very much, and so we can walk around and count them. And we can count the numbers that survived. And we can do that on a, a bunch of different islands that are affected by the El Nino. And when we graph that, we found something really interesting. So here's the percent that survived on the y-axis, and here's the levels of glucocorticoids at 15 minutes after us catching them. If your glucocorticoids were really high, you tended, the, the animals tended to die. Whereas if the glucocorticoids are really low, they tended to survive. So this was really interesting, but it became even more interesting a couple of days later because this happened. This is the Jessica. It's a ship that was coming into port in order to provide fuel oil to the, all of the tourist ships in the Galapagos. And the captain got, uh, he was supposed to wait for the pilot that was going to take him in. And he decided he didn't feel like waiting for the pilot. So he went in without the pilot and ran into a reef and dumped all of his fuel into the Galapagos. And what happened then was that all this oil flowing out affected all the animals. And you can see here this iguana is completely covered in oil. And if we look at the archipelago, something really interesting happened. Here's where, this is the, the islands, all of the islands of the Galapagos. And here's where the ship ran into the reef. And this is where the, the main tides go in the Galapagos. And you can see that this island, the little island right here, Santa Fe, the, is the most affected island. And we were working right here on the east coast three days before the Jessica ran aground. So we quickly, I had already started teaching, so I quickly called up my colleagues in Ecuador, and they sent a couple of Ecuadorian graduate students out to Santa Fe, and they collected some samples. And we found this. Maybe not too surprising. So here's the animals from the pre-oil spill, from just as we caught them, and their levels at 15 minutes after catcher. Whereas in the oil-contaminated animals, had much higher levels of glucocorticoids, both the initial levels and the response after 15 minutes. Remember this, because it's gonna be really important in a second. This is probably not surprising to any of you, right? Oil was stressing out these iguanas. But this is a wonderful cartoon from uh, Omen at the Oregonian, talking about how all of this oil was gonna kill all of these animals. This is what happened with the Exxon Valdez. This is what happened with the New Horizons spill. All these animals were getting coated with oil and they were all dying. That didn't happen in the Galapagos. Very few animals died. So in fact, there was a big court case where the National Park sued this oil company for damages, and the oil companies basically said, eh, no harm, no foul. Basically, you can't prove that we hurt any animals in the Galapagos. Yeah, we're sorry we ran, ran aground. We're sorry we dumped the oil in. You know, we'll, we'll you know, promise not to do it in the future, but you can't charge us anything else for damages because there weren't any damages. But look at this figure again. Here's our levels at 15 minutes. It was about 11. And we put that on this graph that we got from the El Nino. Here's 11. They come up here, and we would predict about 65% of the animals would survive about 45% would die. 
This was just as just after the uh, the oil spill. We had no idea what was going to happen. There were no dead animals at the time. But we went back a year later, and this is what we found. So here's again, here's where the ship ran aground. Here's the island that was affected, Santa Fe. This island up here in green is Henovesa, totally out of the way of all of the oils, completely unaffected. And we went back there a year, and what we see is 100% survival on Henovesa. Whereas on Santa Fe, we predicted 65% survival. We actually got 45% survival. So we came pretty close at actually predicting how many of these animals were going to die and how many were going to live. Now one of the interesting questions, why do we get so close at predicting it? Especially when none of the animals were dying immediately. They were dying several months later. They didn't die immediately. And so why? What we think ha is happening is that marine iguanas are kind of like cows. They can't actually digest the marine algae that they eat. They have a bacteria in their stomachs that digests the algae for them. And so what we think is that that oil was ingested and killed their bacteria in their gut. And so they ended up dying of starvation, just like they would have during an El Nino. Now, to finish the story, however, this paper that we published was then used as evidence in the trial. And they said, ah, but you did kill animals. Look at all of these animals that you killed here in Santa Fe that were affected, and none of these animals up here were from uh, Santa Vesa died. And it turned out that the judge and the jury agreed, and they awarded a multi-million dollar judgment against the oil company, and that has then been gone to the National Park Service to help in their conservation missions. One other thing, yeah, <laughs> it was very lucky. One other thing about this, though, it's not just that they died of starvation. So I'm going to show you some, a, a, kind of a strange um, slide, but it's mostly to show you a point. So these are the skulls that were collected from the beach after an El Nino. And it just shows you they're all really large skulls because the El Nino mostly kills the largest iguanas. But these are the skulls that remain from the individuals killed by the oil spill. Some big individuals, some small individuals. So the oil spill actually killed individuals all over the age groups. And this is going to make it much more difficult for the marine iguanas to recover because they've lost uh, their young, not just their older individuals. So interestingly enough, this comes back to here. We had five, I told you about five things that cause stress in wild animals, but I'm missing one from this list. And that is humans creating environmental change. And so that's a, the sixth kind of thing that can ha affect wild animals that doesn't really affect humans at all. But what it, think, what it brings us to is the idea that maybe we can use stress physiology as a tool to understanding the impacts of global climate change. So thinking about this a little more deeply, this is a wonderful picture. I love this, uh, created by Eric Sanderson for one of his books. This is a picture of Manhattan, Manhattan Island, from today and from four or 500 years ago. So this is what it used to look like. This is what it looks like today. And if you're an animal living on this side and you don't want to go extinct, you're going to have to figure out a way of adapting to live in that. And so that's what we start talking about in terms of conservation. So the theory of conservation is that we have a, some sort of a human disturbance, like an oil spill or like um, building cities. And that is likely to impact population numbers. And if the population numbers are impacted too much, then we're really worried about it from a conservation standpoint. But there's a problem with this, is that in order to measure population numbers, we have to wait until the human disturbance has already happened. And that means it's almost impossible to prevent that human disturbance because it's already happened. So people in conservation have been trying to figure out how can we predict what human activities are going to cause population declines and which ones are not. So one hypothesis is that we could use stress physiology. So here again is that starling being chased by that, that eagle. So this is the response we've been talking about. There's a stressor, it impacts an animal, where we get hormone release. So we get physiological responses and behavioral responses, and all of these are trying to help the individual animal to survive. So what we might be able to do is use human disturbance as that stressor. And then we can look at the survival of individuals, animals, 
and see if they can survive, interpret from that whether or not survival would, in fact, impact con population numbers. So let me give you an example of how we might be able to do that, coming back to the Galapagos. So one of the problems in the Galapagos right now is on a number of islands, there are a number of feral cats and dogs. So here's a picture of some of those feral dogs. Now the other thing about the iguanas, I told you that when, when we go out and we catch them, they're very tame. So we can come, we can grab them, and we can pick them up by hand. The same thing, unfortunately, is true of these predators. So this is a, a tame dog, but we're using it to try to, ex to uh, explore how well these iguanas react to a predator. So here's the dog, here's the iguana. It's letting that dog get very, very close. Okay? And in fact, here's that same dog, here's an iguana, right here. Right? That iguana is not going to make it if that dog decides to attack. And in fact, <clears throat> they tend to not. So if we look at the flight initiation distance, so this is the distance that an animal will let you come before it starts to run away. So what we can do is we can start walking towards the animal. And when we get to that area where it starts to run, we'll drop a bean bag onto the ground and then walk over here. This is where it left. And then we can measure that distance and figure out, OK, how close did that animal let us come? And what we see is that when dogs or cats are absent, they let us come to within a meter. So I brought my trusty ruler. So one meter, they will let us come that close. But when dogs and cats are present, they do learn. So they will now move to about four meters. Well, let's see, what is that? Right about here. So four meters. Actually, can you just grab a hold of that? My trusty assistant. <laughs> Okay? Reasonable, right? But probably still not enough distance to keep from being eaten by that dog. And so, thanks. So what we see is, in fact, that happening. So here's one of the iguanas that has bite marks on its tail from a feral dog. And in fact, the dogs have been so good at killing these animals, and generally not eating them, by the way. They'll just kill the animals and leave them on the beach that they have really decimated the populations on some of these islands. And so this is a, I know it's kind of a disturbing picture, but I just want to show it to you because what they've done is the National Park Service, in order to prevent disease spreading, has piled up all of those carcasses and are just putting them on fire to burn them. So this is a major problem. And so can we, though, understand why these individuals are not fleeing from this dog? So there's two possibilities here. One is that it comes back to that discrimination determination function again. Are these iguanas simply incapable of realizing that this dog is in fact a predator? Or is it that thousands of years of evolution, being on an island with no predators, they can't even respond to the stress response anymore? And they can't even, even do it. So we tested this. And we got this large stick. And it's, on the end of it is a syringe. And in other experiments, we used a blowgun. So we took this gun, and on the end of it is a, a syringe with a dart. And we can aim right for, whoops, sorry, right for the base of the tail here, this iguana, and inject it with adrenaline or epinephrine, which is one of the major hormones of the fight or flight response. And we can then look at their flight initiation distance. We have just gave them a fight or flight response by injecting the hormone. Do we, in fact, change the flight initiation distance? The answer is yes. So here's the, the initiation distance with water, and here's the, the injection after epinephrine. So we do, in fact, increase the flight initiation distance. But this is still under three meters. It's still not going to be enough space to survive an attack from a feral dog. So the answer, I guess, is a little bit of both. First, they're not really interpreting it, really, that this is a dangerous predator. But even if they did, if they had a response, they can't respond the same way. OK, so just wrapping this up, why study stress in wild animals? And the answer really is twofold. One is that we can try to understand why the stress response evolved. 
so that we can better understand stress in humans. And the second reason is to understand how animals cope with stress from humans. And so these two things are the aspects that have been, uh, for the reason why I've been studying this for the last number of years. And I do need to thank all of the people that have worked in my laboratory. Uh, none of this kind of work is done on your own, and these are all people who have helped me. These are different collaborators. I also need to thank the National Science Foundation, and believe it or not, the Department of Defense is one of the strongest uh, funders of endangered species research in the, in the United States, and they provided some funding for this as well. And if you're, very, and you're really interested in this kind of work and are interested in reading more about it, I encourage you to look up this book, which uh, John Wingfield and I just published at the beginning of this year, and which was described at the beginning of my talk. So thank you. I'd be happy to take any questions. Which response? Yes, so the question is, is the glucocorticoid response universal for all species? So uh, all vertebrate species, okay? So from fish, reptiles, amphibians, birds, mammals, us, we all have virtually identical stress responses to that, the glucocorticoid response and the uh, epinephrine response. By the way, I, I, I forgot to mention, I showed epinephrine there, but I said I injected adrenaline. Does anybody know what the difference is between adrenaline and epinephrine? There is no difference. They're exactly the same hormone. Epinephrine is the name for it in the United States. Adrenaline is the name for it in Europe. So, yes? In the uh, vertebrates, is there a difference in male or female in post-breeding? So the question is, is there a male or female difference? Uh, it depends upon the species. That's some yes, some no. But most of them, uh, from the ones that we showed there, in terms of their response to weather, it doesn't seem to make a difference between males and females. Yeah. Could that, uh, could that post-breeding difference uh, be affect their, their starting to be nervous about the migration cycle? Yeah, so the question is, is, uh, is that difference between breeding and post-breeding just wanting to get out? Um, there's still, when, the, when those uh, data were collected, they were still probably about a month before migrating out. Um, so probably not. But they are going through an interesting um, life phase that we don't go through, although some of our pets do, which is called molt. So they're in the process of dropping their feathers and replacing them. And so there's a very big different um, physiological state that these birds are in that they're going to have to cope with. And just like your dog who drops its, its hair and sheds, these birds are dropping their feathers and replacing them. So that may have more to do with this than trying to get out or trying to migrate. Yes? Uh, I noticed in the, uh, when you showed the slide of the iguanas where you had the pre-oil and post-oil, um, so like the line sort of shifted up afterwards, but the slope also changed a lot. Is that, is that like acclimation happening? Is, or if you had to make any explanation for that? Yeah, so I, let's see if I can repeat the question first. Uh, is that um, why would the oil infect, uh, affect in animals is not only the, the response higher both initially and at the end, but also the slope different. I don't know the answer to that. Uh, it probably is that these animals are just highly stressed. And so their initial levels are high because they're trying to cope with the oil and they're, they're getting higher because all of a sudden they're not only coping with the oil but coping with a predator, me, having caught them. And so they're having this big augmented response and the whole system is probably augmented and getting ready to go. Um, what that means for the individual is probably not much if it could have cleared and not killed its uh, bacteria. It probably would have had a short-term response. The oil would have gone away and it would have come right back and it had been fine. Yeah? Is there any difference in, in terms of um, the fact that suppose an animal is elephant to a large brain sized mammal or smaller brain sized mammal? Yeah, so the question is, uh, is there a difference between different kinds of brain sizes or different kinds of intelligence with animals? Uh, my, my easy answer is no because we sh humans, which are supposedly really intelligent, um, sometimes I doubt that statement, but uh, we see exactly the same kinds of responses in us as are seen in these wild animals. But sometimes what can change is that discrimination determination function. That in more intelligent species like us 
may in fact be better, right? I'm not sure that an animal, even if it had a parachute, would ever understand that being tossed out of an airplane wasn't a bad thing. And yet some humans do learn that. Yes? Yeah, so the question, if, let's see if I can summarize it, but is, is it a, a difference in maybe either genetics or how they are thinking about or coping with the predation pressure? Is that causing a stressor? Um, I think it probably is the predation pressure itself. Uh, it can be pretty intense. When the lemming densities are high up there, everything comes to eat them. Uh, the snowy owls are there. There's birds called Jaegers, which are relatives of uh, seagulls. They're eating all the lemmings. The Arctic foxes are showing up. The weasels are showing up. All of them are, are there to eat the lemmings. I call them sort of the popcorn of the Arctic, because <laughs> everything wants to eat them. And so the, the pressure on, on them must be intense. Um, however, you know, you don't need a stress response if you're dead. Right? So those animals that I showed you obviously didn't, didn't survive. So the question is what happens to those who, who escaped and is their stress response different? Um, unfortunately, I don't know because they escaped. So those are the ones we, could, we counted. But when we catch the animals that, that haven't yet been caught, those are the responses that I was showing you. So they do seem to have a heightened awareness that all these predators are around. By the way, just, just in case anybody was wondering, you do know that lemmings do not commit suicide, right? <laughs> that is a complete myth. And if you want me to tell you where that myth comes from, I'm sh unfortunately, it'll pop, pop a bunch of bubbles, I'm sure. So there was these legends that lemmings committed suicide. And one person who heard about these legends was a young filmmaker by the name of Walt Disney. And so he took a film crew up to Point Barrow to film the lemmings committing suicide. And he got up there, and it was a fairly low lemming year. And so no lemmings were committing suicide. There was nothing for him to film. And so he went out and hired a bunch of the Inupiat kids to catch lemmings. And they caught them. They all put them in these boxes. And they put up their film um, cameras right next to the cliff. And they got ready to film it. And they dumped the box out. And none of the lemmings jumped off the cliff. And so then he hired the kids again to herd the lemmings off the cliff. And that's what you see in his famous 1920s era. I think it was 1923, maybe. I can't remember the exact date. But that's what you see in the famous Walt Disney film. Is you don't see the kids herding them off. What you see is all these lemmings jumping off the cliff. What you don't see is the fact that they're actually being herded off. So what I think is the gen genesis of that legend, though, is that lemmings are actually pretty good swimmers. The tundra up at that area in, the, in Alaska is what's called polygon tundra. So there's a lot of little areas of um, ground that surround these really shallow ponds of water. And the, I've seen lemmings swim across these ponds all the time. And what I think happens is that they get to a point where there's so many lemmings around that they all want to disperse. And they get to the edge of the Arctic Ocean and what they see is basically what looks like a big pond. So if you know how waves are produced in the ocean, it has to do with wind. And the, bigger, the, the longer the wind can act, the bigger the waves. So that's why you get much bigger waves on the Pacific coast than you get on the Atlantic coast. But the Arctic Ocean has all this ice, and it breaks up the wind. And so you basically get no waves in the Arctic Ocean. It's basically flat, and, and unless you actually have a storm right then, there's essentially no wave. And so I think these lemmings get up there and they think, you know, I can make it. 
And then they die, and they get washed in, and everybody said, oh, gosh, they must have committed suicide. That's my, hypo that's my theory of the genesis of the legend. But Disney is to blame for all this committing suicide stuff. Yes? So, uh, actually, no. But the reason is that the IRB only covers humans. There is an equivalent called the IACUC. Okay, and yes, I had to have IACUC approval to do every single experiment this year. Yes. Yeah, it's a great question. So the question is, what else would I do if I had a lot more resources? And there's one experiment that I would have loved to have done. And in order to understand the experiment, I'm going to need to uh, give you a little bit of background. So there's one species that probably most of you are familiar with is salmon. Salmon uh, swim up, and they die after they spawn. So there's a one time. They swim up the river, they spawn, they die. Well, it turns out what kills them is high levels of glucocorticoids. So they start swimming upstream, their glucocorticoid levels start to increase, and they increase, and they increase, and they increase, and it just blows apart everything. Blows apart their immune system, blows apart their muscles, um, blows apart their brain, everything. The only thing it doesn't blow apart are the gonads, the ovaries and their testes, so that they can spawn. So one of the questions that happens is we see, I showed you the data showing that as the body condition of these iguanas got worsened, the glucocorticoids stayed really low. And it only increased right near the end, right near the, as it got near death. So one of the questions that we've had is, is that, as I think, it's an increase as a last ditch effort to survive, or are those, is that rise of glucocorticoids actually killing them? And right now, we don't have the answer to that. And it's because we weren't able to complete those experiments down in the Broncos. Yes? Yeah, so the question is, what, what parts of the world have the most stressed out animals? You know what? I can't answer that question. And, and let me tell you why. So there's a long tradition in, in physiology that if you want to understand a system, go study it in the species that, where it's being pushed the hardest. So the best example of this is kidney function. The people who finally figured out how kidneys work did it in two species, camels and kangaroo rats in the Arizona desert, animals that really had to hold on to their water. And that's how they figured out how kidneys work. So I had this great idea, I thought it was a great idea. I would go to a place where it was really, really stressful in order to understand how the stress response worked. And I thought to myself, okay, where are the, some of the most stressful habitats in the world? Well, there's the desert, but I grew up in the desert, so I didn't want to go back there. And there's the Arctic. Start to understand why I went up there. So I go up there, and we're flying into Barrow the first time in the middle of a snowstorm. And this airplane is coming down, and it's getting ready to land. And the pilot looks out, and he goes around. He just doesn't want to land. And he's coming back, and he tries to land again, and nope, comes around again. And then he finally comes down, and he lands on the third time. And I walked out of that airplane, and the person I was with told me my eyes were about yay big. I was hugely stressed for this. Now, look at what those birds were doing. They weren't stressed at all. And I, as the more I thought about it, the more I realized, what is the definition of being adapted to a habitat? It's that it doesn't make you stressed. So I think the answer to your question, actually, is probably no place. That the animals that are living there are living there because that habitat is not stressful to them. Now, the better answer to that question, though, may be, is where humans have made the biggest impact, because that they haven't had a chance to adapt to yet. Yes? Yes. Um, 
I'm sorry, that the question is, are those uh, straight lines and everything real data? I was trying to say this in the beginning. All of the uh, graphs I showed you have real data. They have uh, means and error bars and variances around them. What I tried to do tonight was just try to distill the really important issues and, and, and uh, things from each one of those studies and not get people bogged down in error bars and variance and things like that. If you would like to see those original graphs, I'd be happy to show them to you. Okay? Yeah, no, these were, these were just done to show the important trends, not the actual original data. Yeah, so Yeah, okay, so why, I guess the question is, how did the stress be so uh, clearly connected with glucocorticoids? So, uh, glucocorticoids is the name for a class of steroid hormones. And the most familiar of those hormones to probably all of us here is the human version of it, which is cortisol. And cortisol is often called the stress hormone because anytime individuals are stressed, cortisol goes up. A lot of the animals that I was showing you here don't have cortisol. They have a similar hormone called corticosterone. Same family of steroid hormones, but it, and it seems to function identically as cortisol in humans and in other mammals. Um, so I just tried to make it, not try to confuse everything by calling them all the different uh, names because they're all thought to work in much the same way. And so when we're looking at this, this is, you know, I didn't come up with the idea that glucocorticoids were the, the stress hormone. This was first um, proposed in the 1930s by a scientist named Hans Selye, who was the first one who actually used the word stress and, and called and, and introduced the concept of stress. And what he thought was is that stress came from um, hormones that were being released by the adrenal gland. And when people looked at the adrenal gland, it was cortisol that was being released. And so that's why this connection between stress and cortisol was so strong. And then we're just looking at the same thing in wild animals. Yep. Yes? Does an animal's age affect the stress response? Yeah, great question. So the question was, does the animal's age uh, affect the stress response? And the answer is, in, in humans, absolutely that the stress response tends to decrease as an individual gets older. Uh, we don't know the answer for that for most wild animals because it's very, very difficult to age most wild animals. And so it would be something that I have colleagues that are, that are studying now trying to understand that question. But we mostly just don't know. I think one or two more questions and then we'll move out into the lobby. Yes. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. So why, the question is why um, does it take three minutes to get stressed? It doesn't. It's immediate. What happens is that the first response is your fight or flight response. And it happens so fast that we can't even measure its, its onset. Okay? The reason I focus so much in this lecture about the glucocorticoid response is that 
the glucocorticoids, what happens is that the brain first has to realize that this stimulus is a stressor. And then the brain sends a signal to another part of the brain, which sends a signal to another part of the brain, which sends a signal down to your adrenal glands, and you finally get glucocorticoids released. And that process takes about three minutes before you start seeing those hormones being released. And so that's why we study them, because we have that three minute window. But, <clears throat> excuse me, but the whole process is starting immediately. It just takes that long to start to see the result. Does that make more sense? Yeah. Good. Well, I guess there's one more? One more. Yes. Has the military started looking at um, uh, hormone levels in uh, candidate soldiers to see who might be at the greatest risk of the I, my understand, my feeling is no, because uh, there isn't yet any evidence that somebody's stress hormone levels prior to a stressor can often can predict how they will react with post-traumatic stress disorder. But a lot of people are trying to understand exactly that, and they're trying to figure that out. Please uh, join me in thanking Dr. Romero. He'll be available in the lobby if there are more questions.